So uh, the next presentation uh, will be uh, showing you some of the progress that has been made uh, in the snippet project. So uh, Simon uh, has spoken previously about uh, the legal landscape in Flanders. And so from the technical team, we have been trying to take that into consideration, especially the GDPR aspects of it. But um, of course, we had challenges of our own. So uh, I'm going to, uh, all the next speakers will be talking about that. So the snippet, as you may know, stands for uh, secure and privacy friendly peer-to-peer -peer trading. And it, it's about, as my colleague Mustafa put it so well this morning, uh, making everything that Evelyn and Nilufar have spoken about privacy friendly. So um, we, have we have tried to take the perspective of, uh, this is not working. <laughs> yeah. So we have tried to take the perspective of both uh, the end user, and the market participants that can be DSOs or TSOs or balanced responsible parties, as Evelyn mentioned, in the case of flexibility markets, the, the perspective of the market clearance entities, and then the perspective and then the perspective of uh, the entities that will be uh, taking uh, the billing and settlement. Thank you. Uh, that will be performing the billing and settlement. So uh, the first aspect, the first aspect will be bid generation, and my colleague Tony will uh, explain to you how uh, the how we can help users generate their bids because we wanted to empower the users to uh, generate their own bids, whether it's for the peer-to-peer -peer market or the flexibility market, and to set their own prices so as to incentivize people into joining this type of markets. And since um, for, for electricity market, it was a little bit easier to set the prices because we have wholesale markets that can guide us in that. But for the flexibility market, it was very difficult as there is no historical data considering um, residential flexibility. So Tony will give you uh, an overview of his work on uh, how to generate these prices. Uh, so generating the bids means also determining the volumes that will be traded on the peer-to-peer -peer market. So this means generation. And there is a lot of, uh, there is an extensive body of literature on how to forecast PV generation. Phil has mentioned some this morning. And so what we are doing and what Tony will pre be presenting is how to forecast demand. Um, of course, you can forecast your own demand using your own data, but you can also take advantage of your neighbor's data. But as you may see, this uh, runs into privacy issues. So we will be presenting some privacy preserving uh, machine learning methods in our, uh, that will help us for, uh, forecast the demand from your own data, from your neighbor's data, to find a unified model. Then, uh, as these markets leave the user's home uh, to the market clearing entity, they contain sensitive information, just like your identity, um, the volumes you're generating or requesting from the market, the prices that you set uh, that, and you want to receive or offer for electricity, and this is sensitive data, as we have seen on the first day of the school. So uh, to make this market clearance process privacy friendly, we have relied on uh, computation over encrypted data techniques, and especially multi-party computation, or MPC, not to be confused with model predictive control, which some of you are more familiar with. Um, so um, Mariana, my colleague Mariana, will be presenting uh, what is multi-party computation and some examples of how it can be used to generate uh, 
to, to, to help run auctions uh, or optimizations to clear different markets, uh, either day ahead or intraday peer-to-peer -peer markets or local flexibility markets. Um, and after the bills have been, uh, and the market has been cleared, um, the bills uh, will have to be uh, issued. And uh, it's not an easy task for the flexibility market as Evelyn uh, explained this morning, but also for the peer-to-peer -peer market because it's very difficult to um, forecast your demand, forecast your generation, and there are always deviations from the committed volumes. So Akash will be presenting um, a way to fairly uh, allocate uh, the cost of these deviations and how to share them uh, within the community or uh, in a market-wide aspect. So without further ado, uh, here are some snippets of snippets uh, from Tony first. Tony. Thank you, Ferus. Uh, I will be the first one to present our work. I'm in charge with the base generation parts. When we're talking about the base generation, we mm, generate the base from the user's perspective. So it might be different from the other flexibility market you've already seen so far. So we are trying to build a consumer-centric scheme to generate the base from their own needs either their comfort level or either their own uh, price decision power. And uh, yeah, I forgot my self-introduction. Um, I'm Ying Wang. You can also call me Tony as Ferros. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Kilo and uh, Energy Well. OK, when we talk about the base, what do we expect? Uh, first, we have the ID to identify who you are. Or we cannot send you the money, of course. And then we have the directions, which is also quite easy to understand. For the flexibility base, we divide into upward flexibility and downward flexibility to represent as uh, decreasing your consumptions or increase your consumptions. And then we can move to the price. As Ferus mentioned earlier, it's a little bit different from the local energy market represented by, uh, presented by Evelyn this morning. We uh, build this market to focus on consumer centric. So the consumer will have the power to decide how much they want to charge. And that is a challenge. And then the last part is the quantity how much you want to trade and when you want to trade. But for the normal people as a consumer participant, it's a little bit difficult for them to know how to calculate it. For example, I want to sacrifice. Um, two degrees of temperature on my room comfortable for tomorrow, but I do not know how much kilowatt that will be. And that is what we're going to help the consumers to uh, identify. And let's move to the first challenge of flexibility price. Not like the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, trading, the price has a lot of reference, like a uh, wholesale market or intraday market. For the flexibility market, we do not have any historical data, especially from the smaller scale, like uh, household level flexibility. It's very difficult to determine how expensive you should charge for one kilowatt for uh, upward flexibility from uh, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. That's also due to the non-separable attribute for flexibility. Flexibility is highly bounded by multiple attributes, can both equally uh, important to determine the values, mainly like the volume of the flexibility, how much you want to provide, and the time of use, when you want to provide the flexibility, and the duration of the flexibility you provide it. Uh, so to solve this problem, mainly as the non-historical data, uh, we uh, propose approach as geometric brown emotion. Some of you may be familiar with that is a stochastic differential equations. We can use this to simulate a bunch of the price paths with the drift term and also the diffusion terms. And with this equation, we'll be able to generate a random path uh, to represent the 
price signal for flexibility. And then in our study case, we uh, generate one meaning of the similar price paths, and we select them by the similarity compared to our consumption profile locally. And here is the example of the selected seven days reference price. Uh, as we can see, we should have one million reference price, and when we use uh, one year's consumption profile, uh, and for each uh, day of that year's consumption profile, we match it with that one million price path and select the most closed one to represent that uh, flexibility values of that day in these local communities. Uh, as we may recall, uh, in the equations, we have the drift term and the diffusion terms, and we also have the initial price that we can manipulate. And these are the parameters that we can provide for consumers and also the local uh, grid operators to change their um, opinions about the value of the flexibility and to determine how the price path will be generated and also how much your flexibility will be worth. Maybe we can divide them into four uh, parameters for the consumers. The most important two part is the risk attitudes, uh, as we present as a gamma, it's similar as the drift term mu. And we also have the initial price, which uh, can be decided by the consumer how much they think their flexibility at least worth. And that can be calculated or translated by stated preference or uh, revealed preference. And for the local grid, the most important part is the diffusion term. It shows the dependency of the buyers to the local flexibility market, and also the negative factors represent how uh, much renewable energy is in here. And in the later graph, we show the different figures we generated with the different parameters. Like we can see, if you have a higher risk attitudes parameters, then the general tendency of the price path you generate is will have an upward tendencies, and they tend to for uh, they, repre uh, they present the users' attitudes as more risky. They want to gain as much um, uh, benefits from this market as possible, so they tend to have a risky. Uh, the bidding generated. And if you have the negative parameters, the general uh, generalized uh, reference price is a little bit conservative, or the price is considerably low. Uh, that represents they do want to participate in the market regarding if how much uh, benefits they can gain from the market. And same as the uh, diffusion terms, if we have the smaller diffusion term, we have the relatively mild tendency that the DSO is less, uh, in de uh, less dependent on this market. They have other options to mitigate their conjunction problem with others. And the negative factor is simply uh, adjust, him, uh, adjust the price signal. So if you have negative price signals, then that means you need to encourage your consumptions, which means we need more uh, downward flexibility. So now we have the reference price. Uh, with this, we can fit into the neural network or other data-driven method to predict the next day's uh, flexibility price. Uh, since we have the price signal for the base, now we need to determine how much we should provide uh, for flexibility. In this chapter, I divide the house-level flexible device into uh, three categories. Uh, one is the thermostatically controlled load, which we um, interpret the user's comfort level as a preferred uh, temperature intervals. Uh, and then the second one is the e, uh, the e ways and the storage system. They have the similar characteristics, so we uh, interpret their user comfort level as state of charge. And the last one is the deferrable load, which can also be uh, explained as the white devices. And their constraints or their impact to the user's comfort is mainly um, they have to stay as a bulk. For example, you cannot run your dishwashers for one hour and then leave it uh, idle and for the other two hours. That's not possible. And the user can also um, choose which time slot they do not want to shift these uh, demands. And then for the first uh, 
group with the thermal testicle, it controlled the load, uh, how we consider the user's comfort level. For each time t, we will calculate the temperatures in this room by these equations. And then this temperature will follow the constraints represented in here. It will, uh, within the user's uh, temperature, uh, preferred temperature intervals, it will not violate anyone's. And also, it has its own uh, physical constraints as the consumption, uh, as its powers. For example, for the thermal testicle control the load, they cannot uh, be low zeros. That means they will generate powers in some ways, and that is not possible. So, for each time slot, we'll calculate the possible power they can provide for uh, as of visibility without violating any constraints from here. And then we have similar uh, equations with e ways and the storage system, but they are way easier than the thermal testicle controlled. The basically because they have uh, more straightforward constraints. They only need to consider if the constraints, uh, the state of charge remains the required intervals, and if the charging power is uh, not violating their own physical characteristics. And then for the deferrable one, we do not have any equations because the power is already fixed. You can only turn it on and off. And the operation period cannot be interrupted. So when we submit this uh, facility base, we submit uh, in a continuous hours time slots. And also in here, we will try to submit the two feasibility base in one day. Uh, as I mentioned, for the direction, we have upward feasibility base and downward feasibility base. And for the deferrable loads, when you defer it from a time period, you are providing some upward feasibility by uh, reducing the consumptions. And when you refer to a time slot, then actually you're providing downward force of feasibility by uh, increasing your consumption at that time period. And the constraint is not available time intervals for the users. And now we have the quantity and the price. So I will give you the example of how the market, feasibility market operating here. Uh, this is the first market we designed in the Snippy project. It's quite simple and open. It runs uh, on open miner, so we do not consider the privacy in here. Uh, my colleague Mariana can uh, introduce another market with the uh, privacy concerns. So in here is a day ahead of consumer-centric flexibility market that accepts base per hour. And as we mentioned before the market established, we need to determine how uh, much to recharge for the flexibility. And that's mainly deal with uh, sold by the geometric Brownian motion and Monte Carlo method. With this uh, reference price we generated, we'll be able to predict the day ahead uh, price signals. And with the data high price signals and the comfortable level constraints, the home energy management system can generate the base at home and then aggregate them together to the auction platforms. Uh, so the auction platform, they do not have the flexibility per device, but they have the flexibility per household. And as the simulation, uh, we select um, 30 household with five different uh, characteristics. They have different devices and they also have different uh, trading strategies. And this is the result we get from the market clearance. Uh, the first figure we show is the mean square error of market clearance price. As we can see for the first few weeks, the mean square error of the market clearance price is very high, which is understandable because we are comparing the actual market clearance price with the reference price we already generated. Uh, but after that few, first few weeks, the mean square error tends to be uh, stable, and that means our market reached the equilibrium. And as an example, we can show the uh, price we generated from the reference price and uh, the, mark, uh, the actual price uh, we got from the market clearance. They are quite similar, but we have significant uh, difference. Like for the real market clearance, we have a lot of zero movement, but for the reference, we are continuous. That brings the big difference at the first few weeks. And then, uh, 
even though we talk about the uh, even though when we talk about the uh, consumer centric flexibility market we try to benefit more to the consumer as the uh, individual household level but the system operators there so they also have some benefits by participating in this market which mainly as the load shifting uh, on the top graph is the original loads for one day's uh, community consumption. As we can see, we have uh, quite a lot of peak movements. And in the lower part is the consumption, uh, the community consumption after they participate in the flexibility market. And in the left hand side, we can see we already removed the uh, peak load from the known time to other place. Uh, but we still have a significant peak at, uh, at 6 p.m. That is due to the constraint from users' comfort level. They do not want to shift their loads forward uh, in case of violating their own daily life. And if we don't consider the comfort level, then we'll have a more advanced or more forward shift loading, but that's not what we're looking for. Uh, so this is the base generation from the flexibility market part and how we can benefit from the consumer-centric flexibility market. And now we're going to move to the peer-to-peer -peer electricity base generations. Uh, as we mentioned before, for flexibility uh, base, it's a little bit easier because we do not need to determine the price or quantity. For the quantity, you already know how much it will offer if you have the PV uh, generation at home. And for the price, we have a lot of existing reference price, and we can easily have some help or get some guide from them. But the new challenge is when and how much should I trade with my neighbors? Because I can give my offer as I generate a lot of PVs, but I do not sure when they will need it. So, that's the tricky things. One way we can do is politely knock on the neighbor's door and say, hey, do you want to buy some electricity from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m.? I have a lot of PVs. But that's apparently very creepy, and we do not want to have that all the times. That's why we have the locks on the door. And the, another alternative way is to work together with the DSO in, um, since we cannot get the individual demands from our neighbors, it's also nice to have aggregated demand for the whole community. Then we'll know when is the peak hour, and that is the best moment for us to submit our base. But if we want to get an aggregated uh, consumption for the community, that means we need to share our data, our own individual consumption to someone, no matter DSO or other third parties. And from the legal terms, we know the GDPR will help us to protect our personal individual consumption data that it do not be misused. But from the technical point of view, I think the best way to do it is, is do not share your individual consumption data. You cannot protect it if you do not know where it exists. So how to solve this problem? Like we need the data from others, or we need the benefits of the data from others, but we cannot share due to the privacy or trust issues. And then from the technical works, we proposed a new method we called federated learning, which decoupled the data storage from the training process. So this is a simple graph to show how the data are located. All the private data remains locally. So in here, we have the central server. It can be DSO or market uh, clearance party. They will initialize, um, maybe I'll use the next flow chart. Yeah, they will initialize a global uh, model, and then they will public to all the clients. In here, the clients represent the consumers. And the consumers using their own private data to train this global model. But they only train it, they do not update that. Instead of update their uh, global model, they send this waste together to the central server. And the central server will perform predefined algorithm like a federated uh, stock 
uh, SGD or federated average or other uh, more advanced algorithms to deal with the weights they collected or the gradients they collected. And then they will calculate a new ways and use this new way to update the original global model. And then they will announce this global model to the consumers again. And after several rounds of training, we will reach a convergence. And then we have a ready to use global model to predict the um, community's consumption. And this is a training process of federated learning. And the next figure, I will show you how the data are stored. Uh, in this figure, we can see uh, all the private data are uh, 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 located uh, in the consumer themselves. And the only uh, thing exchanged for the external communication is the public information global model, which is the same for every consumers. And the other external ch they change is the gradient updates from each consumers. Uh, this largely increased the security of the raw data since the individual consumption will be not shared to anyone but only stored at your own house. But in some research, the concerns about the gradients updates in some attacks, we can get the info sensitive information from the gradients only, like your identity or the partic uh, participants, or even they can reverse the exact raw data from the trainings. But luckily for the time series uh, analysis, in our case, the attacks to reverse the original data is a little bit difficult. And we can also add up other secured methods to enhance these data security problems, like a secured aggregation or differential privacy. But that's not the important part. And later, I will show you the simulation result from the federated learning model. In this one, we have 30 households together to train the uh, simple density neural network and to predict the um, community's consumptions. And we can say the federated learning model performance is kind of worse than the centralized model in most of the times, which is quite normal and considerable since in our simulation result, we tend to average every waste we collected. So the model tend to update it to the local optimal or even in between some optimals. But with some uh, research teams work, we know the clustering will uh, largely improve this uh, accuracy for federated learning models, either uh, clustering before you participate in the actual training or clustering on the weights itself. And this is what we are doing now. And then the literature is, shows the daily consumption of one client uh, with the prediction from the both side. And the blue part is the real consumption with this neighborhood, and then the other two are the uh, prediction result from uh, both training style models. Uh, we can see they are quite similar with the general prediction tendency, but they all fail to capture the peak value, which is also a common problem with the neural network structures. And there are some ways to uh, solve it, and that is our uh, future work, but it's beyond the Snippy project. Uh, okay, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, I will quickly conclusion. Uh, so in my part of work, uh, I try to build a consumer-centric flexibility market and also determine the price for consumers. And then we proposed a privacy-friendly machine learning. And I will give the floor to Mariana. Uh, yeah, so I will talk about the market, market clearance. And market clearance essentially has to do with auction algorithms. So we want to determine who will trade electricity with whom, the trading price, and so on. But as usual, we have the privacy issue that if we are all sending how much we want to buy, the price we, are, uh, we want to pay, then everyone will be able to predict uh, something about our consumption patterns. <coughs> And uh, because we want to design these uh, auction algorithms um, to be privacy preserving by default, uh, we use uh, this cryptographic technique called multi-party computation or MPC. And Camille already briefly mentioned this in the morning, but I will give a bit more information about it. 
So in a usual auction without privacy, the users would just send their bids to a single entity who would act as a trading platform. And this trading platform would be able to see all the bids from all the participants. Uh, but in multi-party computation, we have a decentralized trading platform. So in this case, we have three computational parties and the users will send uh, their bids divided into three pieces, uh, which we call the secret shares. Uh, so these uh, square brackets mean that the, the bids have been secret shared. And uh, one important thing about secret shares is that uh, each secret share by itself looks completely random. So each computational party will have some information that is somehow related to the uh, private information, but to this computational party, this uh, value looks completely random. And together they will perform a computation, but they will not be able to see over which information they are computing. Uh, and at the end, they will just put their shares together, and by getting all the shares together, they can uh, reconstruct the final correct value. Now, of course, that if the parties are acting maliciously, they can just put their shares together right at the, at the beginning and reconstruct the original uh, user information. Uh, but that's why we usually choose the computational parties to be uh, entities with conflicting interests. So for example, in this case, it could be a user representative, an aggregator, and a supplier. And as long as uh, not all the parties are acting maliciously, then the, the privacy will be preserved. Okay, so I will just give some information about how to do calculations with multi-party computation. There are different ways to secret share the private values, but the easiest one to understand is additive secret sharing, where the sum of all the three secret shares uh, is the, exactly the, the secret value. And to do additions between two secret values, uh, A and B, it is enough for the, each computational party to locally add their shares of both secrets. So this is very easy. Uh, but if we try to do the same for multiplications, uh, then we can see that this doesn't work. So if we expand the, the multiplication here, we will see that there are some uh, terms that depend on uh, shares from different parties. So the only way to compute multiplications is by having some communication between the parties. And I will not go into how this works, but uh, what this means is that uh, MPC has the problem of being rather communication heavy. So every other uh, computation, uh, every other calculation, for example, comparisons or anything else that we want to compute will be based upon these two uh, basic operations and all of the other uh, operations will be usually more expensive. So in multiplications, we have to perform one communication round between the parties. But if we want to do comparisons, there are seven communication rounds. So we have to be very careful with how we design the algorithms so that it doesn't become super slow. And another thing that we want, we need to be careful with we, when using MPC is that um, usually in uh, non-private <laughs> algorithms, uh, we have uh, branches that depend on values. So for example, if X is zero, we do this operation, but if X is one, we do something else. Now, of course, that if we don't know the, what value X is, then we cannot have these two branches. So we have to get the way around this. So these are, these are two things that we have to be careful when using MPC. And now I will talk about some of the auction algorithms we designed with MPC. So we did both uh, intraday auction algorithms and day ahead. And I will start with intraday auctions. And well, actually MPC has already, is already being used to deploy uh, some uh, real world auctions in the financial se sector, uh, specifically for um, high frequency markets. So these are uh, algorithms that have to be really fast. So we actually used some previous work that has been done because in the intraday uh, market, we need algorithms that are uh, relatively fast since we are computing things uh, well for uh, in the same day. Uh, and we adapt these algorithms that already exist to this uh, use case of the peer-to-peer -peer electricity market. So um, yeah, so the first one is the continuous double auction. and in a normal continuous double auction, what happens is that there is a list of orders waiting to be traded. And when the new order arrives, we see if there, there are orders already waiting that have a compatible price. And if that's the case, then we match the orders. Of course, that all of these values are uh, secret shared. So the price and the 
the, the quantity. Um, now for the electricity market, we also want to give priority to closer neighbors, uh, which minimizes transmission losses. So what we do is that we add some information about the location of the user who sent the order. So they also send these X and Y coordinates. And each time a new order arrives, we calculate the distance between the new order and all of the orders already uh, in the order book. And we divide them into distance categories. Because uh, if we want to fully order the different distances, this will become very expensive. So it's easier to just divide them into different categories. And first we match the orders that are in the closest category, and then we move on to the next one, and so on. Okay, so then we performed some uh, experiments for running this with different amounts of orders um, and different uh, numbers of distance categories. And well, this is the time for processing each new order. And even though uh, we have uh, at most 10 seconds for processing each order, this can actually be uh, too much if we are, if we are receiving uh, too many orders or if there are too many participants. So I would say that this continuous double auction algorithm is good if we are not working with a population that is too large. Also because every new order that arrives is then introduced in the list. So even if the volume is completely matched, because we do not know if the order has any volume left or not, because everything is secret, we always have to keep it uh, in the list in case there, are, there is still some volume there. Okay, the, the next algorithm, the volume matching, is uh, faster and simpler because it doesn't use prices. So the price is taken uh, from some uh, external reference market and the users decide how much volume they want to trade for that price. So they only uh, send uh, their secret shares for their IDs and the buy and sell volumes. Uh, yeah, so essentially for this, we just need to see which direction has more total volume, either buy or sell. And for the direction with least total volume, then uh, we already know all the volume will be traded. And then we just need to check how many of the orders in the other direction we can trade. Uh, Again, we would like to uh, prioritize closer neighbors. So what we can do is that we take uh, our population and divide into several areas, and then we can uh, perform one auction in each of these areas. Uh, then the leftover orders, so we assume that for each of these auctions, there will be some orders that were not uh, fulfilled. And these orders, they can be uh, then traded in an inter-neighborhood auction. Uh, or they can also be used to compensate for deviations between the committed values in the bids and the actual production. And this will be later explained by Akash when he explains the billing methods. Yeah. Uh, additionally, if we also want to prioritize uh, smaller users who have smaller productions, we can do something similar to what we did before with distance categories and insert uh, the bids into size categories where we first match smaller bids and then we move on to to larger ones. So again, we have some uh, computation times. And these are the computation times not for one single order as before, but for uh, all of these orders here. So as you can see, this is uh, much faster than before, because even if we have uh, 100,000 orders, we can process all of them in just over uh, six minutes. Uh, so this, if we have a large population, this would be a more appropriate uh, algorithm. Yeah, so I will now go into the day ahead uh, auction mechanisms. Uh, the first one is a flexibility auction that's uh, similar to what Tony presented, but this is um, a bit different because we introduce not only the um, privacy aspect, but also we optimize the consumption schedule in order to uh, have consumption precisely when the day ahead prices are higher, uh, lower. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and then we use the results from this flexibility auction to, to build an electricity auction that uses demand response. Okay, so our flexibility auction is based on the three-step approach. So first, the participants uh, submit their bids to the trading platform. So this trading platform, of course, is decentralized. So the, these uh, computational parties will receive their secret shares and they will aggregate the the orders from, uh, from the participants. Then after they aggregated the shares with a multi-party computation, they will actually reveal the aggregated values since these are not, no longer uh, 
individual uh, private data, and then they will perform an optimization such that the the consumption schedule uh, happens exactly when the the, the day ahead prices are lower, and then we distribute the. Um, the allocated flexibility to the different uh, devices that submitted bids. Okay, so the trading platform starts by, by uh, sending a list of prices and these are the bids that are submitted by the users. So depending on the device that they want to allocate flexibility for, they will uh, submit different types of constraints. Uh, so they each type of device will have uh, uh, a time by which it needs to be ready and uh, a time that it needs to run for. For example, depending on your electric vehicle, you might need to uh, charge it for longer or not. Uh, so you, s you send all of these uh, information, the time at which your device needs to be ready and the price and the volume and also the type of device. And as Tony mentioned, we consider three types of devices. Uh, the first one is uh, the thermostatically controlled loads, which are sort of like uh, air conditionings because you do not you not do not really have a deadline. You can stop stop it or end it according to to what you need and your flexibility. Then the elect electric vehicles you need to finish uh, charging by the time you need to get out of the house, of course. And the washing machine types, which you cannot interrupt once you started the cycle, or at least is probably not advisable. Um, Exactly, so once the trading platform uh, receives all of these bits, it will aggregate not only the flexibility, but also all of the constraints for all of the devices. And then it will perform this um, optimization where it not only tries to optimize the revenue for buyers and sellers, but also it tries to uh, minimize the price paid according to the day ahead prices. And of course, all of the constraints for electricity need to be uh, satisfied as well. Then uh, for allocating the flexibility, uh, what we do is that first we have to make sure that if we have washing machines running, they need to finish running. So first we attribute power to this uh, type of device that is already running. And then we also attribute power to devices that have their deadlines very close. And then we continue attributing power according to how close the deadline for finishing running is. And similarly for flexibility. Uh, yeah, so we performed some uh, uh, simulations considering 200 devices um, with one hour time steps. And um, well, as you can see here in this graph, uh, we have that the, the blue dotted line is the day ahead price and the red line is the, the allocated power. So we can see that the power was allocated precisely when the day ahead prices were lower, uh, which was exactly the purpose of the optimization. Okay, then how do we use this to build a peer-to-peer -peer electricity market? Um, so the trading platform will not only publish a set of prices for flexibility, it will also publish a set of prices for electricity market. And the users not only submit uh, bids for flexibility, they also submit bids for electricity, where they say their demand and their generation for each time slot. And well, depending on the, whether there's more demand or more generation, then this will be a bid for buying or selling electricity. Uh, then according to the flexibility that is uh, allocated for each time slot, what we do is that we change the bids uh, for electricity. So if you actually started running your uh, washing machine earlier than you were planning initially, then maybe your uh, demand for that time slot will be different. So according to the output of the flexibility market, we change the bids that we received for the electricity market, and then we perform a double auction where we see who exactly will trade electricity uh, in this market. So uh, now that we saw the auction algorithms, we need also to know how to bill the participants. And uh, for this, we have Akash who will, will talk about billing. <clears throat> Thank you, Mariana. So my part in the SEPE project came towards the end. It's still an ongoing project, so I'll only show some initial findings uh, for how to achieve billing and settlements in uh, the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading in a privacy-preserving way. 
So just to give an outline for my talk, uh, I'll motivate why we need new billing models for this specific context. And um, then I'll also give a recap of the current method of billing in retail markets. And then I'll talk about the proposed methods in our research so far. Um, after that, I'll show some evaluations and kind of make it clear how it, like, these billing models are incentivizing the users. Um, and then I'll conclude the talk, not just for myself, but also my colleagues. Uh, so basically, we all know here that uh, the smart grid and smart meters can unlock a lot of nice applications. Uh, you can call them smart energy applications. And uh, we know that peer-to-peer -peer electricity trading has gained quite a lot of attention. Uh, so we all know that peer-to-peer -peer energy trading basically allows users to trade electricity with each other. Uh, how that's done is by using some kind of an auction mechanism. So users would participate in this auction mechanism uh, to determine the trading price and the volume to be traded. Uh, Mariana already spoke about how that can be done in a privacy-preserving way. And then uh, the users would need to, to, to be able to participate in this auction, they would need to predict how much supply or demand uh, they would actually have to form their bid and offers. And Tony spoke about how that can also be done in a privacy-preserving way. Uh, but the problem here is that these predictions might not be correct. That I might predict that I'm going to use two kilowatt hour of electricity in the next trading slot, but it could be I only use 1.5. Uh, and the existing literature does not uh, basically, they, they largely ignore this issue, and they usually assume perfect fulfillment. Uh, so in our research, we wanted to accommodate this deviation in new billing models in a way that we can penalize the users, but in a, in a, like uh, we wanted to minimize this penalty as well. And I'll explain in future slides how we can do that with like using a concept of community or the market altogether. So I'm gonna skip through this because we're running out of time. Uh, this was just the entities that are involved in the, in the current billing mechanism. And uh, how that works is that suppliers usually establish a contract with uh, some users, like presumers or consumers. And um, the consumers would basically pay for what they have consumed after a certain period of time. And the presumers would basically uh, get uh, some kind of an incentive by injecting electricity to the grid uh, with a price called the feed-in tariff. Uh, but the disadvantages of this mechanism are quite a few, actually. Uh, so you see that the retail price is usually quite high, and it can also be affected by current affairs. In the UK, the average price is 30 pennies per kilowatt hour, and this keeps rising due to some uh, political issues. Uh, the feed-in tariff, of course, is quite low. Uh, in the UK, it's only 5 pen pennies uh, per kilowatt hour. So you can see the disparity between uh, the feed-in tariff and the retail price, which basically does not incentivize users to invest in renewable energy. I mean, the investment required for PV cells, it requires ages if we follow this billing mechanism to actually get a good return on our investments. Uh, so in our proposed billing models, we would use a retail market as a fallback option, but only the first three. In the last one, we will introduce the concept of the mid-market. And Marianne already mentioned uh, how we can accommodate there uh, the, the bids and offers of the people who could not participate in the peer-to-peer -peer trading. So you can see here uh, two types of arrows, solid and dash. In the solid ones basically represent the electricity flow and the dotted ones uh, represent the cash ones. And uh, just to explain how the retail market can be used as a fallback option, I'm gonna just give a brief introduction. So we know that the consumers and prosumers would submit the bids and offers for, elect for the electricity based on their demand supply predictions. And uh, then there would be a market operator who would uh, basically determine the following things. Uh, how much total uh, volume of electricity would be cleared, what would be the trading price, and uh, who will be the consumers or consumers that would participate in this uh, trading. Um, after these two things are done, uh, the, the smart meter data would be used to actually calculate the consumer bills and the consumer rewards. And uh, as I mentioned, in case of the deviations from the committed values, uh, the retail market would be used as a fallback option. So just to give you an, uh, an idea of how that's done, we'll talk about the first uh, billing model. Uh, but I want to show you how these billing models look in our actual paper. They look like this. But I'm not going to, of course, go step by step with these algorithms. What I would do is that I will try to explain them on a very high level using some text and also very childish animation. So uh, the first billing model uh, is called the individual cost split. It's just to give you an idea of how the retail market can be used as a fallback. 
So uh, in this model, the individual consumers and prosumers who will partake in the peer-to-peer -peer -peer market would bear the cost of their uh, individual deviations. So let's say that uh, the positive deviations of all the users would be traded at the retail market and the negative deviations would be compensated from this retail market. So as an example, if uh, there is a positive deviation from a presumer, by positive deviation I mean if they supply electricity more than they promised, uh, they would basically sell it at the retail market for a feed-in tariff, like how it's, how, uh, it's done. And uh, while the negative deviation of presumers, by that I mean if they promise they will supply 2 kilowatt hours of electricity and they only sell uh, supply 1.5, they would buy that deviation from the retail market and sell it on feeding tariff. So you can see the penalty here, right? They're buying it for 30 pennies uh, per kilowatt hour and they're selling it for 5. So that's the penalty that they have to suffer. In terms of consumers, uh, the positive deviations would be also bought at the retail market for a retail price. <clears throat> so let's say that I'm a consumer and I say I'm going to consume uh, 1.5 kilowatt hour and I consume uh, 2. I will buy this extra 0.5 from the retail market at a uh, retail price. At the same time, the negative deviations of the customers would be bought for the trading price. So basically, let's say I say I will consume 2 and I consume 1.5. I'll just buy all that 2 for trading price and I'll sell the 0.5 for feed-in tariff. So this is the penalty for the consumers. So you see with this interplay how the retail market is being used as a fallback option. So now the time for the childish animation comes. On the left-hand side, you will see the set of consumers. On the right-hand side, you will see the set of presumers. And we already know that they'll have some kind of predictions. The predictions for the consumers are, are the yellow. Yeah, the yellow. And the predictions for the presumers are green. But and we also know that there's going to be some deviations, right? So I uh, symbolize these deviations with color red for the consumer and color blue for the presumer. So you can see that uh, the consumer two over here is over consuming a little bit and the consumer five over here is under consuming a little bit. And uh, we already know that they all, these all consumers and presumers will have to deal with their own, their own devi deviations themselves. That's the individual cost split. But if this, you see the total deviation over here, this is the total deviation that has to be compensated through the retail market. And in our billing models, we would like to, and we would try to kind of reduce this total deviation that has to be compensated by the retail market, because if we reduce this, the penalties on the, uh, the users will also uh, reduce. So uh, then we thought to ourselves, how can we do this? How can we reduce this total deviation that is being compensated through the retail market? And in order to do that, we started assuming, uh, why don't we just do some, uh, like a, a community, like a social context? So we assumed uh, in, instead of individual consumers, a set of consumers, and instead of individual prosumers, a set of prosumers. And what we did was call the social cost split. So in the social cost split, the second billing model, uh, the individual devi deviations of prosumers or consumers are aggregated together, and then they will be split equally amongst all the deviating parties. So you have to, as, like in this case, imagine consumers as a separate set and prosumers as a separate set. So if there are some deviating consumers, all of their deviations would be kind of aggregated together and they will all uh, have to socially split it together. To give an example, don't read that text, it's way too big. I'll just give you, uh, like, I'll explain it on a high level. So if the total supply deviation of prosumers is negative, that means that um, the presumer set as a whole said that they will deliver 10 kilowatt hour of electricity in the next trading slot, but they only end up delivering eight. In that case, um, the presumers who actually over-delivered would, uh, would be able to sell all of this over-delivered electricity at a trading price. Because it doesn't make sense, right? If you, if you think about it, if the total supply deviation is any, anyways negative, then the over-delivering presumers are actually helping the under-delivering presumers by compensating for their deviations. Uh, to show this more in a, in a context of childish animations, I can show you this figure again. And you already know this was the fact of the individual deviations where each consumer and each presumer had their own individual deviation. And then there was a whole addition of the total deviation that was uh, being compensated to the retail market. And I only give you an example of consumer two and consumer five. So if you look at them, consumer two is over consuming and consumer five is under consuming, right? And the deviation is kind of similar. So if you, if you aggregate their deviations, the deviation of over consumption and under consumption would cancel each other out. So that would actually give us 
a little bit less of the deviation that we have to compensate from the retail market. Uh, so this was still not enough for us and we wanted to uh, reduce this deviation even further. And for that, we decided to merge the set of consumers and prosumers together as a market. So in that context, we called it the universal cost split. And in the universal cost split, there is absolutely no concept of having a prosumer set or consumer set. All of these users are um, kind of considered to be one. So let's say that we will add, of, add up all the individual deviation of users, and this aggregated value would be called the total deviation of the peer-to-peer -peer market. In that sense, unlike the previous models, as I already mentioned, there is, this is not prosumer or consumer specific, and it assumes all users in the market. So if this total aggregated deviation is positive, in our billing model, that basically tells us that the total supply in, uh, in the market is more than the total demand. In that case, all of the consumers can buy electricity at trading price, regardless of their deviation. So even if they're over consuming, they will still be allowed to buy electricity at trading price because there's just way too much electricity being injected to the grid by the consumers. And if the total deviation is negative, in that sense, uh, the total supply of the market is less than the total demand. All the consumers would be able to sell their electricity at a trading price, um, and uh, regardless of the deviations as well. So if there is a consumer who's over-delivering, he would just be able to sell that electricity at trading price instead of the feed-in tariff. Um, and uh, so how that looks is that, as I already mentioned, instead of looking at these individual deviations, we will look at the total deviations. We will add them together. And as you can see on the right-hand side, the deviation of the consumer is a little bit more than the deviations of the uh, consumer. So that would basically mean that, mean that the total deviation, deviation is positive. And the, this will be the result of that. So as you can see with the progressing billing models, the total deviation that is now uh, required to be compensated by the retail market has been reduced to this tiny spec. But uh, until now, we've only considered the users um, that actually got selected uh, during the auction to sell the electricity or buy electricity at, uh, at the peer-to-peer -peer market. What about the users that were not accepted uh, in, the, in the auction? For, for those specific users, we kind of had an additional market as a fallback option, and that market was called the mid-market. So let's see how that works. So uh, this last billing model was called the universal cost split, uh, and we added the concept of a mid-market here. So what the mid-market would do would be that it is an additional fallback option, but is actually the first choice of the peer-to-peer -peer users. So instead of trying to compensate for their deviations on the retail market, they would first compensate for the deviations on the mid-market. And uh, all the unsuccessful bids and offers uh, of the people who were not chosen during these auctions will also be sold and bought at this mid-market for a mid-market price. So how do we calculate this mid-market price? It's basically a function of both the retail price and the trading price. So it has to be better than the retail price, of, uh, of course, but worse than the trading price because we don't want to incentivize everyone to go to the mid-market first. Uh, the mid-market would also enable the non-peer-to-peer -peer users to buy and sell electricity at better prices. So not only the people who are trying to participate in the auctions, but also the people who just want to buy electricity without being involved in this peer-to-peer -peer trading. So how that would look like is that it would be just like the universal cost split. So we would have this tiny spec of deviation that we still have to compensate. But instead of going to the re retail market, we would go to this new market called the mid-market. So this was done just to see what kind of impact can it actually have on the incentives of the users if we assume an existence of a new kind of market. And actually, uh, as you will see in our evaluations, it's quite considerable. So. Before I talk about the evaluations, I'll explain a little bit in, uh, briefly uh, what, what was the experimental setup actually. So we assumed three suppliers, ABC, and we had 15 participants, five consumers and 10 consumers. Of course, it's a very small setup. Um, <clears throat> and we allocated these users to the suppliers. Uh, like, so supplier C had a little bit more users than B, and then B had a little bit more than A. So if you see on the left-hand side, you will see uh, these three colors, the blue, the orange, and the gray. The blue color symbolizes the volume and the profit of supplier C. The orange symbolizes the volume and the profit of supplier B. And the gray will symbolize the volume and the profit of supplier A. And as you can see, as we progress through these billing models, the volume created by the supplier in this in market is actually quite reducing quite significantly. 
At the same time, their profit is also reducing, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because if the total deviation that is being compensated from the retail market is also reducing, the volume that they trade and the profits that they get will also reduce. But at the same time, the impact on the consumers and consumers uh, is quite nice. You can see that uh, in the retail market, the consumers only used to have rewards of, let's say, 2.8 euros per kilowatt hour in total, and the bills used to be like around 18. Uh, with the uh, universal cost split, that already increased quite a lot to, let's say, 4 point something, and the bill fell down to below 16 euros. But as soon as the middle market was um, introduced, that increased even further. But that's not the advantage of the mid market over here. The advantage of the mid market is for the users that were not accepted to be to to trade at this peer-to-peer -peer energy market. So on the right hand side, you can see that um, the the blue symbolizes the consumer rewards and the orange symbolizes the consumer bills. And uh, as compared to all the other billing methods, their rewards and bills uh, really. Uh, improved significantly with the introduction of the mid market. Uh, so, to conclude my presentation, I think it's time, yeah, uh, and all my colleagues' presentation as well. Uh, so, we, as a first step in a separate project, proposed a privacy preserving bit generation method, uh, which was basically our first contribution. And then uh, we also showed that using MPC, multi body computation, uh, we can obtain uh, efficient and scalable market clearance al algorithms. Uh, that do not reveal individual user data, which is the goal of the project. We are supposed to be fully privacy preserving. And uh, we also know that unless equipped with batteries, the users will always deviate from their predictions uh, and commitments at the peer to peer markets. So, to accommodate these deviations in a fair way with a user centric mindset, we uh, propose some billing models uh, in the initial part of this research. And as future work, we plan to actually run large scale simulations. And uh, we already have run large-scale simulations instead of the evaluations I showed you with 15 people. We already have similar results with 150 uh, participants, users as well. And uh, the, this is still ongoing. We're trying to implement these billing models in a fully privacy-preserving way by using some computing over encrypted data methodologies. Um, with, that, with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening to me. And uh, I would like to call my colleagues on the stage for answering some questions. Thank you. Thank you.